Hi folks, thanks to be here for this talk about a gentle introduction to stream processing. I'm Nicola Frankel, I've worked two decades in IT for uh, most of the time I worked in technical roles such as developers and since two years I'm a developer advocate. I work for a company called Hazelcast. Uh, Hazelcast has two products. Uh, first is an in-memory data grid and you can think about an in-memory data grid as data structures that are distributed along the network. So it's distributed system uh, with replication and shoring. The second is Hazelcast Jet and I will uh, need it for the demo so I will describe it later on. This is our schedule for today. Uh, the first uh, point that I want to talk about is why are we to the point where we use streaming, data streaming, stream processing. You might know it um, with several names, but it's becoming more and more ubiquitous. And there is a reason why we are at this point and I need to describe it. Then I will uh, tell you about uh, two different streaming approaches. Then, as I mentioned, I will need to describe a bit Hazelcast Jet. And because streaming or data streaming is only as good as the data that you use, I will also uh, have a point about open data. Like open data is probably to data was open source is to uh, source code, but I, I want to go a bit more into details there. Uh, also, the demo is about showing public transportation on a map and I need a standard for that. And so I will talk a bit about the general transit field specification. And uh, finally, I will try to run the demo. And of course, since it's a demo, there is a chance it won't work. But um, well, I, I rehearse a lot and so it should. As I mentioned, I've been two decades in IT and when I started working, uh, data, they were all stored in SQL databases. And when we think about it, um, in some cases, those SQL databases are not really adapted uh, to, to what uh, we want to do. Um, like, for example, I have two use cases in mind. The first one is analytics. You are a supermarket um, sales director and you want to have the sales of the previous hour so you can say hey i didn't sell enough bananas or fishes oh let's make a discount so you want to have uh, the results very very fast and probably you don't want to uh, run any joins or you just want okay what are the sales in each department uh, the other one is uh, reporting uh, probably when you want to have your annual uh, account closing, again, you don't want to run through all the year's um, operations to get the final result. You, you probably just want to have the result ready because you have uh, like thousands, millions of, of customers and it's going to take a long, long time uh, if you need to run those operations. And so when I talk about those two use cases, um, there are already some like trade-offs involved. Um, the first one is sometimes you want correct data, like, yes, we want to uh, have mathematical computation and we need to be very precise. Um, but sometimes you, you just want to have um, fast data, like analytics. Uh, whether your sales number is up by 0.1% or down by 0.1%, you don't care that much. It won't change your, the decision-making process. Uh, what is important is you, you get the data when you need it. And um, yeah, SQL is about being normalized. You, you probably have learned about normal forms and the first and the second and third normal forms. And well, in analytics, um, in, in, in reporting, you don't care about the data being normalized. And because the data being normalized means um, it's um, stored in different tables and you, may, you need to make a joins and it's, it's a penalty, it's a performance penalty 
So what you, you prefer is, well, you don't care, you want face data, so let's denormalize everything. And the fundamental, fundamental uh, tension is, in one case, we are interested in writes, like in normal SQL use cases, but in reporting, in analytics, we are only doing reads. And, and the, the use case for reads is completely different from the use case from writes. As I mentioned, that's the problem of SQL. I mean, SQL is very focused on correct data, on uh, how you should write. So it's constraints and joins and normal forms. And yes, when we want performance, not that great. And so even at the time, 20 years ago, we had this need for an extract transform load pattern because we have different actors with different needs and it didn't make any sense to use the same database. So what we did is we designed the batch model and the batch model is all about extracting data from one database, transforming it and probably it will mean, it will mean um, to denormalize it and load it into a like, dedicated database that you only read from. I mean, you write from uh, the batch, but users, they just read the data now. And well, if you have been working a bit in IT, batches, they are everywhere. Uh, I was a consultant for a long time. And well, in every customer I went to, like they had batches. Like they had like daily batches, weekly batches, but they had batches. And speaking about batches, yeah, batches they have two interesting properties for us. Um, they they are they are scheduled most of the time. They are scheduled, so sometimes they run manually, but it's very rare in general. Hey, you run it every day or every week or every, and they take some time to run. And when you first develop your batch, um, you make sure that the time it runs in is lower than the scheduled frequency. So um, if you have a batch that runs every hour, you make sure that it runs under an hour and probably you take a big margin buffer. Because what happens with time is your data will grow. And so the batch will probably take more time to run. And so there are some fun things that can happen after some time. Um, yes, you took a buffer, data will grow and it will take more time. So even with this buffer, at some point, you will notice that you are getting close uh, to the limit. So if, you, if your uh, bench runs uh, hourly, every hour, then you will like start sweating because every day you see that, hey, it takes 50 minutes, 51 minutes, 52 minutes. And yes, it happens sometimes. It goes over the limit. So when your when your uh, new batch instance is scheduled to start, the old batch instance has, didn't finish, and that's not really really fun. Uh, it also happens that yes, when you are doing batching, you probably are loading everything uh, in memory, and at some point your data that is stored on disk is going to take a lot of place in memory and even more so than you can handle. And uh, getting back uh, to the time it takes to run the batch, um, I, wa I was not mentioning that sometimes the batch may fail. So even if your batch takes half an hour for hourly batch, if uh, you fail two times, you probably will have issues and the next batch um, will start before the old batch uh, successfully finishes. So even when you have a big buffer, even if your data doesn't grow, even if everything is under control, uh, batches then may fail and, and bad stuff happens at the time. So there are a couple of solutions. 
regarding the fact that um, like it, it will take a long, uh, a, a big place in memory, or that the batch may fail and we need to start uh, from the beginning again, then we will probably need some chunks. So we will be keeping a cursor and we will be managing chunks of data. That's that's good, but then it, it creates a new question. So what's it's meanwhile, there is new data coming in. So we need to say, oh, this is in, this is out. We need to do some writing. Hey, we, we did um, handle this one. We didn't handle this one. I mean, it's, it's Pandora's box if you go this way. And so the idea was we were limited for a long time because the SQL databases, they were not meant to scale horizontally. Remember two decades ago, uh, I mean, you had enough computing power. If you didn't have enough computing power, you just put more RAM and you add or CPUs um, and you just add enough resources to handle that. And data was pretty limited. Uh, but with time passing, we had a lot of lots of, more, uh, of data to consume, to handle, and to transform. And it grows exponentially. And as you know, uh, vertical scaling is limited and, uh, well, is at best linear. Um, so it, it didn't work. So this big data movement tried to handle that saying, okay, now we will design tools that can scale horizontally. So it's just not adding more RAM and more CPUs, is adding more nodes. And that was the beginning of the NoSQL movement. Uh, by the way, if you uh, think about the NoSQL movement, uh, you, you must think about uh, again, write versus read. Like it's very easy when you are doing NoSQL to say, hey, we don't have no constraint, everything is fine. We just dumped data into the data store. Okay, that's fine, that's good. But then when you read the data, you need to know its form. With SQL, it's very easy. You have tables, you have constraints, you have PKs and you have uh, foreign keys. So you know the form of the data. With NoSQL, it's very hard. You, you need to look at each uh, item. Uh, if we are in a document uh, database, you need to understand each document to know what form it will have. And you infer that, yes, documents will mostly be similar to each other. So here I see a document that seems like customer and perhaps the next document will be about customers too. But I mean, since there is no constraints on right, there is no schema on right, that means that uh, when you process the data, you must like create your own schema from the read, uh, which again is an issue because uh, it impacts performance. You, you need checks everywhere. And then came event-driven architecture. And in event-driven architecture, there is this word event. And basically an event is just something that happens. That's uh, in, even in UML, you have this kind of event and something happened. And now in computer system, what we are doing is we are reacting to this event. We are doing something with this event. So if you add more data to a database, this is an event. And so we can think about making everything even based. And that's the basis for streaming. And the idea it's it's very memory friendly because when you are when you add data, it's small. It's might be self-contained or not, but it's pretty small. So it's memory friendly. You don't need to, to load everything into memory and like uh, terabytes. Because it's small, it's also easily processed. And there is um, like an added benefit. It's the pull versus push model. Like when you are doing batches, 
you are explicitly pulling data from one place to another. When you've got streaming, data is pushed onto you. And so every time there is a change in data, you can do something. And this is not real time because there is no such thing as real time. Even light takes time to move from one place to another, but this is close to real time. And so the second benefit of that is that this derived data can be kept in sync with your source of truth. But we need to change our mindset because before we were dealing with finite data sets, now we must deal with infinite data sets because data can always come. Since I mentioned streaming, uh, you might have heard uh, the word about stateful streams. So of course we all uh, like stateless because it's easier to handle, but sometimes we need to keep, to keep some state. We just cannot handle the, the event, the data event, and do whatever we want and then continue. Like uh, we, we, we sometimes want to do aggregation, like summing or uh, averaging or whatever. And this must be done over a window of time. So I, I won't go into the details here, uh, but remember that streams are not always stateless. Sometimes they must be stateful. And well, streaming is just ETL that is done small. So instead of loading a chunk or everything and processing it and writing it, well, we do the same with small bits of data. And you can have many sources, just as in batches, and many different ty type of targets. But the idea is that in between, everything can be distributed. Again, we must handle a lot of data. So that means that we must scale horizontally. Scaling vertically is, well, it's possible, but it's very limited. And our workload is going to get bigger and bigger every day. And it opens lots of doors. Um, now, when we have streaming data, we can have real time, uh, again, not real time, but close to real time dashboards. I told you about um, the supermarket director who haunted um, the, the stats of the latest hour. Now, think about this. We want the stats of the last hour. Uh, when do we run the batch? Do we run the batch when the hour is finished? Meaning that it will take some time to run the batch and we will have the data after. Might take two minutes, one minute, but it won't be when we want the data. Or if we, we can infer the time it takes to run the batch, we need to run the batch a bit before, but then we won't have the complete data. But again, it's not an issue. Having the complex data, like if, if we just compute everything from the 59 minutes, the first 59 minutes in an hour, we still have, will have a good enough understanding that we can take our decisions to uh, like um, make some discounts on such such product. Because the, the fact that we are slicing time by hour is very artificial. Time runs continuously. It's only because our understanding of time uh, is limited that we must say, okay, I want to, to have the states in the, uh, the stats in the last hour. Now imagine that instead of having the stats in the last hour, we have always the, ta the statistics that are coming to us. So perhaps at half the hour, we already have some understanding of, of what happened. We can make decisions. And this is for a human mind, but imagine that we, we, we couple this uh, streaming data to some machine learning model, we can probably make predictions. And this is going to be more and more the case in the future. Also, um, if you have been working in IT for a couple of uh, years, you might have uh, come upon the term complex event processing. Complex event processing was uh, pretty hype when we were doing enterprise service buses in the enterprise. And 
this was the idea that every software would like publish events into the ESB and then other pieces of software would like subscribe to them and then handle them. The idea was if different pieces of software publish different events, then one of them could like infer something complex that, hey, this sensor sends, I don't know, like uh, a rise in temperature, uh, this other sensor um, like um, sent events and uh, you inferred a rise in humidity and well, whatever. And yes, it didn't work that well. And the ESB today is uh, pretty much, I don't know, gone probably. Um, but now with data streaming, you can do um, the exact same stuff. You can do complex event processing. So different data streams, different data events coming from different sources, and you can make something out of it. Regarding um, approach, um, when we talk about events, you probably heard a lot about Kafka. And just something to remember, Kafka is about storing events. Um, but there is also something called Apache Pulsar. Uh, I won't go into the depths of it. Just know that it's, Kafka is not the only event storing uh, system out there. Regarding Kafka, uh, well, it has some interesting properties. The first uh, is distributed by, by, by nature, is distributed. Again, we, we want everything to be uh, horizontally scalable and storage is, is among one of the things we want to be distributed. Um, it stores on disk, which um, in some cases is a good thing. In some other cases might not be a good thing. Meaning that um, if we need to handle uh, data, we don't want to store data and transform data and uh, restore data on disk. Perhaps we just want to get from something in memory to something in memory. In that case, storing on disk might not be such a good idea. Uh, but sometimes we want to store on disk. In that case, Kafka is very good. And um, events, they are, they are stored on a topic. And the good thing is that um, like producer and consumer are decoupled in such a way that the consumer um, keep track of the offset of the of the message in the topic that it, it, it last read. So that you can have a very, very fast producer that writes on the topic and a slow consumer. And the consumer will uh, consume data at its own pace. Even more, uh, you can have uh, consumers with a different that are reading at different speeds and they all work very well together. And as I mentioned, you, you don't always want to write on disk. Sometimes you want to handle data in memory. And in that case, you have uh, stream processing engines. So there are different types of them. Um, some of them are installed on premise, for example, Apache Flink or Hazelcars Jet. Some are cloud-based, Kinesis, Dataflow. And um, I need to mention Apache Beam. Uh, Apache Beam is an interesting uh, Apache project, in my opinion. It tries to be an abstraction over a stream processing engine. So there is this uh, API, and then you can more or less um, like change the implementation, changing uh, uh, Flink for Jet, for example, or something like that. Um, I think it's a good initiative, of course, uh, since there is no such standard. So all stream processing engine, they work more or less the same, but there is no standard. And so um, it's, it's an abstraction that is a bit leaky, of course, but still I, I believe it's, it's interesting to have a look at it. Hazelcast Jet. Um, first, it's open source project. So everything that I will show you is open source. Um, we are using uh, in-memory data grid underneath to source storm state. And the good thing about the MPI is that um, you can uh, start from batching because streaming, again, you need to change your mindset. So um, you, you can start from batching and then change one line of code and then you've got streaming. And it's pretty, pretty good. 
All the stream processing engine basically are built on those two building blocks, but here I will use the semantics of jets. Some others might have different semantics, but uh, you will uh, easily match them. So on, on the left side, we have the pipeline and the pipeline is the code that you write. It's a declarative uh, pipeline where you say, hey, I will read from this source. I will do this uh, step of transformation, this other step of transformation, blah, blah, blah. And then I will write there. Um, once you have written your code, you can um, like send it to the stream processing engine. Now the stream processing engine receives the pipeline and it's its job to execute it on the cluster. It has several nodes and it's up to the, um, to the stream processing engine to say, okay, I will um, like transform it into a job and send it to different nodes. And it will do the routing, it will do the control, it will, it will do everything. Jet has two deployment modes. Um, the first one, if you are a Java developer uh, or a GVM developer, let's say, um, it's the easiest one. It's just a library you add it to your class path. And now um, every time you start your application, you can start also a Jet node. Uh, they will um, like multicast, they will try to auto discover themselves. Then they will form a cluster. And this is good, but it is um, quite limited in that uh, the problem is now you cannot scale horizontally your application from your jet cluster. So you are bound by the lowest uh, performance hit on each of them. And also, if you uh, know about the GVM, you know that uh, probably you need to configure it to have uh, the best performance. And in that case, again, uh, you need either to configure the GVM to be uh, like more performant regarding your application or more performant regarding uh, the cluster. In general, what you do uh, very soon is you move to the client server mode where you have a jet cluster and you have your application. And your application now is just a client of the cluster. And now you can scale them independently. You can configure them independently. And as an added benefit, uh, you don't need to use Java on the client side. So we have uh, an API for Python, an API for C Sharp, an API for Node.js, an API um, for Go and for C and C++. So it gives you a lot more freedom. Here is just a bird's eye view of, of Jet. We have default readers, we have default writers and in the middle, as I mentioned, you can do all the transform and whatever. Something um, that is worth mentioning is that if there is no reader or no writer that uh, is um, adapted to your use case, there is an API to write your own. So in the demo, I will uh, show you how you can uh, read from a web service, for example. And also uh, something that is very important is enrichment. As I mentioned, the events that are um, uh, handled through uh, the pipeline, they are small, they might be self-contained. And in general, on, on, the, on the right side, on the right side, you want your events uh, to have all the data. You don't want to uh, need to go to another SQL database, for example. This is also true for the pipeline. You don't want every time you need to enrich uh, to add more data. So you have, for example, you have a sensor and you have the sensor ID and you have all your sensors in your SQL database. If every time you need to look to, uh, to the SQL database to get all data from the sensor and to uh, put uh, the full-fledged sensor data into your events, it will be a performance hit. So the idea is, in general, what you do, and that's what I'm doing in the demo, you load everything into memory first, for example, in IMDG. And then since everything is in memory in JET and since everything is in memory in IMDG, well, there is a chance that they are on the same node. That's very easy. Then you just get it from the memory. If it's in another node, perhaps data has been replicated. Otherwise, it's just um, a, a round trip over the network. So it's much faster than reading from the disk. 
Now that we have defined data streaming, we need some data to work on. And as I mentioned in my introduction, open data is to data was open source was to, to, to software before. And uh, whereas open source is pretty settled right now, um, open data is much more confidential because I believe uh, the um, data part of things was also much more confidential than source code. Um, since I live in France and I work in Switzerland, um, I like reference the stuff uh, from France and Switzerland. Also European Union has some big open data initiative. So the idea is those state, those public organizations, they try to make data as much data available uh, to people so that they can like benefit society. Um, but they are all open data initiatives also in California. And depending where you are from, there will probably some kind of open data initiative in your region. But once we get data, you will notice that there are some challenges. Uh, it's not a free lunch. So I will talk about how you access the data. What's the format of the data? Is there any standards and the correctness of the data? As developers, uh, I would infer, I would assume that you access data indirectly through a web service. Um, that's very, very wrong. Most uh, public administrations, they let you have open data and you, you need to download the data from a file, which defeats the purpose of having data streaming because now you need to schedule a batch that downloads the file and whatever. Um, regarding the formats, you might also infer that open data means open format. So you would think about uh, text or perhaps XML or even JSON. Um, well, let me tell you that a lot of open data uh, is through Excel files and not even the new Excel files, which is just a zip with multiple XML files in it. No, no, I'm telling you about the old Excel formats, which is binary and completely proprietary, which is a bit funny. When I'm using data, again, I'm like, I don't want to infer the format of the data. I would like to have a structure. Uh, like I want to have schema on write, not schema on read. And XML was super good. So imagine that we are using XML. Well, what's the grammar? I mean, is it SVG? Is it MathML? What is it? Um, and I would like to have this standard that is congruent to a domain. If I'm doing public transportation, I, I want to have the grammar for public transportation. Um, well, let's say that uh, in general, again, there are some good exceptions, but in general, it's up to you to, to infer uh, the formats of the data. Or if you are lucky, then perhaps there is like 100 page of documentation and you need to, to browse through them and to understand what's the form. Data correctness, that's the final uh, nail in the coffin, is that uh, you might have heard data scientists complaining that, yeah, they, they are not doing really data science, like 80% of their time is uh, they, they are trying to clean up the data. And here you can see it from, um, one, uh, from the demo. Here I have a time. And I know what uh, 16 hour 20 is. I have a hard time understanding what 25 hour 00 is. Um, is it, well, is it invalid data? Is it one o'clock AM the next day? What, what, what should I do? Um, and again, I, I have no clue. So that, that's the kind of stuff that uh, you are confronted with when you use open data. And here I have, uh, I need to talk about uh, some standards. Um, th there is this stuff in public transportation called GTFS. And GTFS since stands for General Transit Fit Specification. And it, it allows you um, to give data in, a, in an expected format. So you have two kinds of data. The first one is data that changes rarely. For example, the stops. 
the stops, probably the bus stop, the, the, the train stop, the train station, they rarely move around. So it stands to reason that you download them beforehand or perhaps every week or every month, I don't know. And, and then you, you keep them here. And the, the, the second set of data is uh, the position, sorry, the, the dynamic data, for example, the position, which actually is the streaming data because um, when the, the, the public transport, the train moves, for example, it will uh, sense its position. And yes, this is actually the streaming data as it is. Here, for references, you have all the files of the static model. And you can see there are a lot. Some of them are required. Some of them are optional. Uh, and here you have the dynamic model. <laughs> and um, yes, it, it's, it's, it's quite complicated. So here, this is the root message. You have a feed message. And then you have uh, in this feed message, which is uh, the outer envelope, uh, you, you have uh, many feed entities and each feed entity might have a vehicle position. And that's what we are interested in. And I've already done this talk before, and especially the demo. And before I use a Swiss provider, um, unfortunately, the Swiss provider um, changed uh, its, its data access. Uh, a lot so that I cannot do streaming anymore. So um, now I'm using a, a California provider, but I kept the same pipeline, uh, which is the following. Um, I will read from a web service. So that's good. I'm using a web service. Um, and I will uh, split uh, this uh, feed message that you that you saw the envelope into the different uh, feed entity. And then every time I will, en I will do some enrichment from the static files that I've previously downloaded. And I will put everything into a Hazelcast IndG map. And this gives me the following architecture. Um, here I have a jet cluster that runs. And well, I have a single mode because I run it on my machine, but uh, you can like, scale it however you want. And at first, like before, um, before actually streaming, I will uh, launch a job that actually will read from those downloaded files and like read them, transform them into some form of JSON and store the JSON into IMDG. Then when that is done, I have another job that I send to the cluster and this job will call the REST endpoint, the open data endpoint, and again, do the pipeline that I referenced in the previous slides and store the JSON in IMDG as well. And then I have a third component. This component reads from changing, changes in IMDG and will like get the data. And on the front end, I will be able to display the position of the buses in real time. So now it's time for me to show you the code. So here is the project. Um, I have the first module. Um, I'm sorry, this is Java. Uh, um, sorry, this is Kotlin. I'm using a Maven, um, but uh, of course, I believe this is uh, pretty uh, readable. So here you have this load static uh, module that uh, reads from the files. And then I have the stream dynamic that models the pipeline to read from the web service. And here we can have our main stuff. And here I, I, I told you about the pipeline and I believe it's uh, pretty readable. I will read from the service. I will flat map so i will explode the envelope and i will get it to uh, feed entities then i will map each of them to json sometimes i want to filter out data that i i don't want that's some data that is fishy so i will remove entities that are without trips or entities that are without stops then as i mentioned i will do some enrichment so i will 
uh, adds to this entity the stop time, the trips, and the routes. And here, um, I, I, I can do the same with the stops. So here, the map using IMAP is I'm, I'm getting the ID um, from um, something that is already stored in the map. Here, I need to do some more additional uh, transformation. So I have another API for that. I will write it down in uh, the log because I just want to make sure. And I will transform this JSON to um, an entry, meaning I will need to have an ID and to have a value. And I will store that in the remote map. And then I have this web application that reads from this re remote map and put everything into a WebSocket. So let's first start Jet. I'm running inside my IDE. But if you want to do that demo at home, um, there are instructions on how you can do it without the ID. Here is just much easier for me to do that. And let's load the static data. Um, for this purpose of demonstration, I only have one single agency, meaning I, I won't have a lot of data. So it runs pretty fast. And yes, probably it's already finished now so as you can see not very uh, it's not doesn't take too long and now i can stream the data so there when i'm streaming the data i will make the call to the web service and again as i mentioned like do some lot of transformation and store everything into mbg again and now it's time for me to like start the web application Yes, and now I will start. I will open a browser and you can see that um, I already have the routes that are displayed and I have the buses and you can see the buses, they are moving. So the idea here is that um, I receive data every X seconds. So, um, I, I, I am interpolating because I received the schedule. So when I received the schedule, I receive also position of the vehicle. I set it on the map. And when I receive the schedule, it tells me, hey, it should be there at this time at the next stop. So I'm interpolating. And I when I receive the new data, well, perhaps the interpolation was wrong. So I need to put it perhaps a bit backward, a bit forward. So that's sometimes why you see this like teleportation of, of the bosses going backward and forwards. Like here, for example, it happened. Um, so it's just that, yes, um, it, it's not like the exact position. If we wanted to add the exact position, uh, we could just have snapshots. And that's not what we want. We have to, uh, to we want to have like a smoothly moving uh, vehicles. So when I receive new data, I need to say, oh, interpolation. Okay, I need to check whether it was right or wrong. If it was wrong, then I, I need to put the, the, the transport in its correct location. And uh, obviously this provider is mainly located on the eastern uh, side of uh, San Francisco. So Recap of this talk, uh, streaming has a lot of benefits. Um, um, you can leverage available data. So it can be your the data of your company. Uh, but if you don't have such data or you don't have enough, you can also leverage open data. And it's really, really good. Uh, you, you can do a lot of, of cool stuff. So thanks for your attention. Um, you can read my blog. You can follow me on Twitter if you want to know more about Jet. Uh, we have a site for that. If you want to get the codes, if you uh, want more detail, uh, you can look at the codes. I try to be uh, very uh, explicit in the codes. And uh, if I got you interested in Jet, uh, please join our Slack. So thanks a lot and have a good day.